jump off a rock. <laughs> hey, Amen. This is our final sermon in this series, Living on the Edge, Samson style. And uh, I just I love that video. It just gets me kind of charged up a minute. And uh, I got to bring myself back to think. I get charged up because of what Jesus Christ has done. I mean, isn't it, isn't it great? What he puts into us and thinks of us to come and die for us is just amazing. But uh, we're, we're looking at this final section of Samson. And uh, Samson led Israel for 20 years. But his life as a judge was so overshadowed by his continued disobedience. I mean, he, was, he lived this playboy lifestyle. He had this Terminator mentality. And I, that just, that level of disobedience when God had put so much trust into him just kind of messed things up for life. And the, the title of today's message is Living on the Edge of Rebellion. Because you know what? All of us at one time or another has probably lived on the edge of rebellion. We're kind of like that nervous bank robber that went in to rob a bank and he held up the bag and pushed the gun across the counter and said, don't stick with me, this is a mess up. <laughs> And we've all messed up on occasion before. And we've blown it big time. In fact, the scripture says in Romans 3, 23, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And there are two significant points that I want us to get out of this message today. And one is this, that rebellion always leaves scars, but God will always restore the rebellious. There's once this little girl who had a, this a problem with temper tantrums. You ever know a little girl like that? And uh, her mom bought her, got her a bag of nails and said, every time you lose your temper, you're going to have to go back out to the fence post and drive in a nail. And after the end of her first day, she had driven 37 nails into that fence post. Well, she began to learn that, you know what, it's easier not to lose my temper than to go out and nail those nails into that fence post. And uh, eventually she said, Mom, guess what? I don't lose my temper anymore. And her mom said, I'm so proud of you. She took her out to the fence post. She said, now for every day that you don't lose your temper, you remove those nails. And eventually she removed every nail from that fence post. And her mother went and took her to that fence post. And she said, now I want you to look at this. The nails are gone. That's great. I'm proud of you. But look at all the holes in the fence post. I want you to know that that fence post will never be the same. And that's kind of like rebellion. God can restore us after we've rebelled, but rebellion always leaves scars, doesn't it? And that's the point that we're going to learn about Samson here. His life was filled with disobedience, filled with scars, but in the end God vindicated him one final time as God restored Samson when he came to God in repentance. So I want to review Samson's life and see that, that Samson was rebellious and he suffered the consequences because of his rebellion. The very last verse we read about Samson in chapter 16 of the book of Judges, verse 31, the Bible reads this, he had led Israel 20 years. And although he was God's anointed, he kept messing up. And he was not spared the devastating consequences of his sin. And I want to point out first that we see the physical consequences due to Samson's rebellion. In verse 20 of Judges chapter 16, we read about Samson and it says this, that then she called, or then Delilah called out this one final time, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And the Bible says the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, and took him down to Gaza. Samson eventually revealed to Delilah the secret of his strength and said, It's in my hair, and his head was shaved. The Philistines came upon uh, Samson there in the end, and you know what? They subdued him, they gouged out his eyes, and they took him to prison. Now, it took a long time for all of that disobedience, all of that rebellion, before God actually did something to kind of straighten the Samson up. And sometimes when there is sin involved in your life, you will not see the consequences to that for years to come. But there are some times when a person sins or they're rebellious against God that the consequences are immediate. I read about Legina Lucabelle Green. 
And she was a bright, intelligent girl. She won a scholarship in chemistry to go to college. Her beauty gained her, uh, a, she finalized in a, 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 a beauty pageant. And she was on Glamour Magazine, People Magazine. She uh, got invited to television shows, to be in some movies, and her stardom gained her the attention of a popular race car driver back in the day. This was back in 1996. And he contacted her, flew her to New York, and uh, she had attributed all this time uh, her success to her strong sense of values. And she said, you know, even all of that time in Hollywood, I think because of my values and my sense of God, that kept me out of the fast lane. That kept me away from the drug and the sex and the alcohol scene. But when this race car driver contacted her, she flew to New York, wooed her over the weekend, uh, said, I want to marry you, proposed marriage. And in that final night they were together, she gave herself to him in, in a wild night of passion. And she woke up and he was gone. And you know what? She had contracted AIDS from that one and only experience that she had that sexual encounter. And Miss Green writes this, by engaging in premarital sex, I had not followed God's will for me, and I'm paying for that mistake. And you know what? Sin leaves scars, sometimes physical scars. Sometimes those are long off, and sometimes they're immediate. And if you have sex outside of marriage just one time, you can get pregnant or you can contract an STD or a fatal disease. If you suffer with addictions, you might not see the consequences of that for years to come with deteriorating health, but you may go out and crash your car that night. Or if you experience chronic worry, you may have restless nights, or you might develop an ulcer. If you in engage and are unfaithful to your spouse, there are going to be consequences of that. Proverbs says the evil deeds of a wicked man ensnare him, but the cords of his sin hold him fast. He will die for a lack of discipline led astray by his own great folly. And Samson suffered grave physical consequences to his sin, and it took years, but they gouged out his eyes. Secondly, I want you to see the relational consequences due to his sin. Verse 21, it says this, Binding him with bronze shackles, they led, they set him to grinding in the prison. Samson's years of wild living... <coughs> Ended him up in jail. Then it took years, but there was no more romancing the women. There were no more relationships, and there he was alone in prison. Imagine the grief that Samson's parents experienced knowing that their son was in prison being tortured. The Bible says this, A foolish son brings grief to his father and bitterness to the one who bore him. And there are relational consequences when people rebel against God and they are disobedient against His will. You may have heard about the businessman who uh, one day they were having a holiday party and reception at work. There was alcohol involved. And his secretary kind of had a little too much to drink. She was drunk. And unwisely, he decided to drive her home. Didn't want her driving drunk. And he drove her home alone. You know, maybe he shouldn't have done that, but, but it was just a gesture of goodwill. Well, he drove his secretary home, dropped her off, and went straight over to pick up his wife. They were going out to dinner. He was driving to the restaurant, and he looked down, and he was startled to see a half-exposed high heel shoe next to him sticking out from underneath the seat. And he distracted his wife, and he grabbed that shoe and tossed it out his window. And when they got to the restaurant, they valet parked there, and uh, he was kind of startled when his wife looked over and said, Do you know where my other shoe is? <laughs> Now, he just wanted to spare her any consequences to what was going on. Not that he was really sinning or anything. But when you sin, understand this. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. And understand that sin is never acted out in a vacuum. You're not going to sin where there's not tentacles that are outreaching. Sinful behavior leaves scars. Dr. Wilkie Winter wrote a commentary on Judges, and he writes this, Sin often causes grief to everyone, even those who are only remotely connected to the sinful situation. And we read that about Samson's life. I mean, he had gone out of his territory to find a wife, 
and he ended up doing some vandalism and murder when he was in the land of the Philistines. The Philistine army comes over to the Israelites. They're seeking revenge against Samson, and the Israelite army is terrified by these Philistines, and they work out this deal with the Philistines, but the, the Israelites go to Samson, and they say this, Don't you realize that the Philistines are ruler over us? What have you done to, to us? Samson. The, put in danger the very people that he vowed to protect. And I tell you, rebellion always leaves scars. It always hurts someone that you're associated with to some degree. And if you do not think that rebellion hurts other people and you're isolated in your sinfulness, just ask the wife of an unfaithful husband who now has to raise three children alone. Or ask the child who has to grow up without a mother. Or ask the person who is grieving at a fresh grave. Or the person sitting at the bedside of the terminally ill. Or just ask a parent. Samson's just beginning to realize the consequences of a lifetime of breaking a Nazarite vow. One after another after another. And there were grave relational consequences that he experienced. He also experienced, and this is probably the greatest, he experienced spiritual consequences as well. Verse 20 of our text in, in Judges chapter 16, verse 20 reads, that she called to Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And it says that he awoke from his sleep and, and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. And here's the saddest verse, one of the saddest verses in the Bible. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. There came a point in his life when he served God and God's miraculous strength would come upon him that the Spirit of God left him. And you cannot act out sin in a vacuum, but before God will pull his Spirit away from you. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 59, your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Sin always caused separation. And as a result, the God of the Israelites was ridiculed. Verse 23 reads, The rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, Our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. As a result of, his, his, of Samson's sin, God, the God of the Israelites, was, was even ridiculed. In the Bible, we also learn of King David when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. The prophet Nathan came to him and said, You have given our enemies an occasion to blaspheme our God. You see, the world always celebrates it when a Christian falls. And you may think, uh, You know, I wonder how many times I've been a Christian where... I have put my God at risk and by my actions given the people who do not know God a reason to blaspheme our God. The poet Lord Byron lived his life in wild living and he wrote this near the end of his life. The thorns I have reaped are of the tree I planted. They have torn me and I bleed. I should have known what fruit would spring from such a tree. And that's the result of sin. And, and the Philistines took the strongest man in the Bible, in the world, and they made a spectacle of him. And you know what? If, if they can do that with him, what can the enemy do to us today? He took the, the most spiritual man in the Bible, David, and you, you look at the strongest man in the Bible, Samson, the wisest man in the Bible, Solomon, and if the enemy can take them down, don't think that he cannot take you down. But that is the effect of sin and rebellion against God. There are always consequences and there are always scars. Now, there are two typical responses of people who experience rebellion, who experience consequence to sin. And one response is this, that people turn away from God. And you, you know, people that in the rebellion, they respond to God and they say, you know what, if, if God was such a good God and He was in control, why would He have allowed that car to crash? Why would He have allowed my spouse to have that affair? If He is a just God, why would He allow that to happen? Well, Job in the Bible suffered greatly. And the Bible says that his wife 
says, why don't you just curse God and die? And by, by the way, I want to add the point here that not all pain and suffering is a result of sin. The Bible says that Job was a righteous man, that he had done nothing against God, but he suffered. So while God does chastise those who love him, and when they sin, he does chastise them and bring them back, and that's painful. Not all pain and suffering is a result of sin. We live in a sinful world, and it might just be the sin of Adam for the reason which we suffer. It may be somebody else's sin. It might be our own sin. But some people point to all the negative circumstances out there, and they blame God, and they reject God. And that's how some people respond to pain in their life. They say, God, I don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. And sometimes that pain and suffering as a result of sin draws people back to God. And that's another response. And this is where Samson's heading. I love verse 22 of our text. It says, the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Although Samson has been living on the edge of rebellion all of his life, and he finds himself suffering due to his own sin, he's still got a conscience. He still has this God factor. You know, he's never verbally blasphemed God. He's never come out and said, God, I just want to curse you and die. He never does it. I think he still has a conscience. Why do I think he still has that? Proverbs 22, 6. Train a child in the way that he should go, and when he's old, he will not turn from it. To their credit, Samson's parents were faithful in teaching him about the Nazarite vow. They taught him, they instructed him, they gave him the wisdom of Scripture, and he was consecrated to God. But somewhere along the line, his parents weren't strong enough to keep him in line, and Samson was too strong and he lost control. Dr. Winter again writes this, ruined character often begins at home. He says, Samson's unbridled passion was evident to his parents. <laughs> But they were not strong enough to oppose him. Winter concluded a spoiled child as Samson proves to be a grief to his parents. And parents, if you expect your children to grow up and stay the course, you have to be faithful to them in discipline. Now, Dr. James Dobson writes about discipline and says either extreme is bad if you're too much a disciplinarian, not too much a disciplinarian. Both extremes are bad. Listen to the admonition of Scripture in Proverbs 13. This is out of the Living Bible. If you refuse, parents, to discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. For if you love him, you would be prompt to punish him. And there are Christian parents who say, you know what? I, I'm just, I'm just going to love my child so much, I cannot cause disappointment in my life. And if you're like that too much where you're not disciplined, you're rejecting the admonition of Scripture and the results that we learn about by experience. And parents, if your children never grow up to respond to your authority, how are they ever going to look to God's authority and say, your will be done? Now, if you do not try to discipline your children, then you haven't obviously considered the long-term consequences and ramifications of you being a parent. I got this off of the internet, and it was obviously written by a child who was disciplined. But it, it goes like this. I had a drug problem when I was young. I was drugged to church on Sunday mornings. I was drugged to family reunions, no matter what kind of weather. I was drugged to the bus stop to go to school every weekend, every weekday. I was drugged by my ears when I was disrespectful to adults. I, I was drugged to the woodshed when I disobeyed my parents. Those drugs are still in my veins, and they affect my behavior in everything I do and say. A drug problem. Proverbs 29 says, Discipline your son, and he will give you peace, but he will bring the light to your soul. Hopefully in the end, when you've done your best as a parent, that your rebellious child like Samson will return to the Lord and be restored. Now the second point that I want you to see about Samson was that he was in prison, but he experienced vindication. He was in prison, but he experienced vindication. Verse 27 reads like this of chapter 16. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there, and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed the Lord. 
Now, the three applications that I want you to get in summing up Samson's life, and they're kind of the pathway back to God for the rebellious that Samson was setting out to do. And one is that no one is exempt from periods of rebellion. Everybody's messed up big time, one another. You're not the exception. Romans 3 says, all of sin and fallen short of the glory of God. So there needs to be this turning point, this turning back to God. Uh, like the prodigal son who took and squandered away his family's wealth, his father's wealth, his inheritance. If the Bible says he came to his senses. And here in Samson's story, it says that he prayed to God. Verse 28, then Samson prayed to the Lord, O sovereign Lord, remember me. So the first step in returning back to God is in admitting your sinfulness, in confessing, in understanding that I must confess. Can you repeat that phrase with me? It's not on the screen, but repeat, I must confess. I must confess. That's the first step after somebody's rebelled back to God. Lee Strobel writes, when we come face to face with our own rebellion against God and are brought to our knees in repentance, we open ourselves up to the forgiveness and grace available through Jesus Christ. How many people are caught in the throes of sin? They've been put in jail. Maybe they're recovering at the hospital at the graveside of a friend. And they're in despair and they've prayed. Judges chapter 16 verse 28, it says, Samson prayed, O God, please strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. And God answered that prayer of Samson. You know, God had been looking for an occasion. To, to judge the Philistines for their evil doing. But God answered that prayer. And here Samson was turning back to God after all these years of rebellion, saying, you know what, I must confess. And he goes to God in this prayer and said, God, please restore me. And God gave Samson a second chance in his final hour. The second application is turn back to God while there is still time. Turn back to God while there is still time. Verse 20, 29 reads, And Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one, his left hand on the other. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Samson served God with his last and final breath, but he repented before he died. He staged, in effect, his own death. But you know what? Nobody knows when they're going to die. You might be 89, you might be 59, 39, or 19, but you do not know when you're going to die. But you need to turn back to God before it's too late, while there's still time. You know, everything has an end. The movies we watch, the books we read, Everything has an end. Even this sermon eventually will end today. But the second step necessary in returning to God, the first is I must confess. The second is repentance. I must repent. Can you repeat that with me? I must repent. That's the second step back to God. Repentance involves three things. One is conviction. Lord, I know I've done wrong. I know there's truth. I know I've, I've rebelled against that. Then there's contrition. I'm sorry I blew it. I know that I got caught, but you know what? I know what truth is. It's not my environment. I know it's my mistake, oh Lord. And there's contrition. I, I know I've hurt people, and you, oh God, by my action. Then the third area is change. I want to turn and go the other direction, oh Lord, with your help. I'm going to repent. And that's what repentance means, is to turn direction. I want to turn back no matter how far down this path of rebellion that I've gone. And I'm going to change my life, oh God, as you give me strength. A.W. Tozer used to say that God loves the bent knee, the wet eye, and the broken heart. 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regrets. It's not enough to say I was wrong. Please forgive my behavior. It's God, give me the strength to change my behavior. Repent while there's still time. One more application, and that is God can forgive you no matter how bad your past. There's a sign that used to hang in a dry cleaner's window. It said, it said they, they boasted about they can get out any stain 
And the sign read this, we'll take it out, then we'll sew up the hole. Because sin always leaves a scar. There's always something that needs to be fixed up. And Samson finally repented, and God restored his dignity, but it cost him his life. Verse 30 reads, Then he killed many more in his death when he died than while he lived. And you know what? Samson has spent his life killing. I mean, he killed, he killed I mean, himself eventually because he wanted to serve God, but he killed his relationships. He killed the Philistines. I mean, he wiped everything out in his path. And the, and the question that we need to ask ourselves today is, what are you going to kill in your life in order to live? The Bible says we have to die to sin. So, in your rebellion, will you understand that you're killing relationships? Maybe you're killing your physical health. Maybe your, your spiritual health. What are you going to kill in your life in order to live? The Bible says we must stop sinning to die to our sin in order to live for God. The Bible says this in Romans 6, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus our Lord. God promises when we die, He will restore us. He will forgive us. I told you about Legina Green contracting AIDS after her first and only sexual experience. The stigma back in the mid-90s about AIDS was so heavy. And she was so destroyed in all ways because of what she was experiencing. She finally experienced this and she wrote, I know Jesus is willing to pardon even our worst failures and knowing that he's forgiven me, I can now forgive myself. The third step involved in coming back to God is something that God does. And that is he promises complete restoration. He promises complete restoration. Listen to the Bible when it says... In Isaiah 55, let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him for he will freely pardon. Psalm 86, you're kind and forgiving, O Lord, abounding in love to all those who call on you. Jeremiah 31, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Max Lucado writes, there are a thousand steps between God and us, and God's going to take every one of them, except one. God requires of us that, he take, that, that we take that first step. God promises complete restoration to anyone who has rebelled if they take that one step to God. So can you repeat, I must take that first step? I must take that first step. That's what God requires of the rebellious. For Him to restore, we've got to step out and say, God, I am yours. Now, the story is told of an eagle on this big block of ice floating down the river, approaching the Niagara Falls there. And here this majestic passenger is floating along, nearing the edge of that falls area. And the story goes that the birds and the animals are calling out to that eagle, escape while there's still a chance, fly off of that block of ice. And the majestic eagle was too proud knowing that he had strong wings and it wouldn't matter how torrent the current or how wild the wind, that he could fly and escape at any moment. And that huge rock of ice goes over Niagara Falls and the majestic eagle spreads its wings to fly only to discover that its talons are embedded in that ice. And it can't escape. And that's the way it often is with the rebellious. Oh, you know, I can jump off of this rebellion anytime. I'm strong enough. I'm not hurting anybody. I hear the cries of those around me. I can escape anytime. Only to discover that it's too late. You've got to take that first step before it's too late if you're rebellious the bible says in first john if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and our feet get entangled in that sin 
If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So take that first step. Learn from the story of Samson. That living on the edge of rebellion always causes scars. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for revealing to us in Scripture the story and the life of Samson. How you gave him supernatural strength to, to be your judge, to be your man. But oh, how he defied his Nazarite vow and was rebellious against you. But how you vindicated him in the end. I pray that we can learn that no matter how much we've messed up in our lifetime, we may feel hopeless by that, embarrassed by that, that we feel that I can't forgive myself or my friends or my relatives can't forgive me. But Father, I pray that we can understand the forgiveness that you offer and that can begin to restore our heart, our relationships, our life. I pray, Father, you would bring dignity back to each one of us as we rely upon you because you give us the strength to carry on. That these aren't futile words written down in an old book for people to rely on as a crutch, but they're your truth. That we're here today not by mistake. That we're hearing these words today not by mistake. That we might change our course if we're heading down the wrong path by saying and yielding to you as Savior and Lord. Maybe there's one today, oh Lord, that's never said, oh, I yield my life to you. And they need to say, I am convicted, I confess my sin, oh God. And I come to you today, oh God, in repentance. And I understand. That's why you sent Jesus Christ to forgive me my sins. And today there might be somebody who's done that somewhere along the way they've rebelled against you, oh God. And that they might need to understand that they need to turn before it's too late. That they might be restored back to you. I pray this for all of us here today. That we might go out and share this good news to others. They may be saved a life filled with destruction and scars. In Jesus' name I pray.